Good morning. Uh, here we are Friday. This is going to be part one of a two-part series. It's going to be about tankers and the construction of tankers. Uh, I got a nice picture here of a really big tanker. Really big. A WLCC. Anybody know what that stands for? Do you know what a uh, uh, VLCC stands for? That's a very large crew carrier. What about a ULCC? That's an ultra large crude carrier. Wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. A WLCC, what do you think? Come on. Wicked large crude carrier, yeah. It's all crewed up by a bunch of uh, New Englanders. Oh God. Low hanging fruit there, guys, low hanging fruit. All right, so here we go, part uh, lecture lecture five uh, on line five, and this is going to be two parts, so this will be five A. And uh, let's see, we'll start here. We'll go back to the uh, beginning, and we need to put. Uh, see, I think I need to adjust this already. I need to put five A there. There, perfect. And. Um, Talking about tankers, we're going to explore all the different reasons about this. You know, basically, let's go right into the lecture here. And we're going to go right into the lecture. So here's some, here's like seven points. Honestly, they're mostly the same as every other ship, uh, large ship in the Merchant Marine. So, you know, they're, they're built the same, the, the bottom construction, the bow construction, the fore end, the aft end, uh, all the stuff that we've talked about, you know, the decks, the, the uh, the hull, everything is the same. Yeah, sure, they look different. They have a different, they have a different thing that they do. But you, you kind of get it. So mostly the same. The framing, the bottom structure, the hull, the decks, the fore end, the aft end. Now this particular point, the next bullet. Let me move it out of the way here. The next bullet, tankers greater than fifty uh, five thousand, greater than five thousand gross tons require a double hull. And I'm going to put a discussion question in, kind of put that out and see who responds. And um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll look favorably on those who, when it comes time to uh, class participation, I'll look favorably on those who, who jump in here. But what was that thing? What was that significant world event, particularly in our industry, that happened a number of years ago? And it's the reason that we have this double hull requirement and what is that double hull requirement all about so i'd like you to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, online research and look at that and think about that way we'll get that discussion going and i'll post that as discussions now the accommodation the bridge are uh, all located aft um, it didn't used to be that way and i'll show you a picture as, as we go through the lecture but everything now is all uh, back on the stern you couldn't just see me. I was waving my hands as if you were, as if I was lecturing in front of the classroom, and you could see me. And then I pointed at that, I pointed at that ship over in the back corner of the classroom, kind of over your uh, your left shoulder, back in the corner by the window. Um, I know if you're in the, the nine o'clock section, you don't see that, but it's there. Um, they have a port and starboard tank, you know, coming down the coming down the, the body of the ship. Uh, from bow to stern, uh, they are port and starboard tanks. On smaller tankers, chemical tankers in particular, they have port and starboard tanks. They also have wing tanks. We'll talk about that. There are longitudinal bulkheads which divide those and then transverse bulkheads. In other words, fore and aft bulkheads, longitudinal, and side to side port and starboard bulkheads, which are called transverse bulkheads. And those are the those are the bulkheads that divide the the ship into um, into the parts. So let's get going here and let's do a, uh, a basic ship. Uh, put the superstructure in first and then I'll come all the way up the main deck. Uh, this ship has a bulbous bow and we're not going to spend a lot of time drawing the stern section but this is the house. And I guess we should have some kind of a stack on that. Uh, maybe we'll have a structure up here. There's the bridge wing coming out. 
and we'll put a little smoke coming out. We'll put a, we might as well make this a US fly here. And so in order to do that, we'll make, a, that looks pretty good. Check, check, check. And uh, all right, so we got a little US flag and we're doing that stuff. Um, supporting the US Merchant Marine. So we've got some uh, lifeboats here. These are, of course, covered lifeboats, davits, so on and so forth, and the deck. And let's see, we gotta probably have some uh, some windows cut in here. I'm trying to make those. Those also have round uh, rounded edges. They're not just squares cut in there, and uh, so on and so forth. Everybody lives back there, the galley, and let's see, this would be the engine room space underneath. We would have a bulkhead that comes down here. We'd have another bulkhead that comes down here. This would all be, doesn't look very big, but believe me, this ship is, you know, a thousand feet long, so it's pretty big. Uh, you know, sort of drawn to scale. Uh, this would be the, the after peak tank. You know what that is. This is the engine room. We're gonna put a double bottom in here, a double bottom. And what, what bulkhead would this be up here? See what I mean? It, it really is all the same stuff. There's the collision bulkhead. Um, and this would all be the four peak tank. And so after peak, four peak. So there you've got your basic setup. Now, we, we're gonna take this tanker, we're gonna divide it into tanks. And let's do that now. We'll go one, two, three, four, five, and we'll label them one, two, three, four, five, and well, we got this space back here. We're not gonna deal with that quite, quite yet. So let's see, we'll go, I think you got that. So we'll, uh, these are gonna be solid bulkheads. I'm just gonna make them a little different so they stand out, but they are solid bulkheads. We're gonna have, liquid in each one of those tanks. Now, remind yourself of the fact that these are not just, um, you know, one big tank all the way from port to starboard. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna redraw this here. I wanna come back for just a minute and I'm gonna redraw this uh, tanker. Oops. I'm gonna redraw it like this and I'm gonna go here and here and uh, we'll We'll have the tanker all the way up like this. So let me color that and let me uh, highlight that. And uh, all right. So here's that collision bulkhead. Here is the uh, the aft the forward bulkhead of the engine room. Here is the after peak bulkhead. And this is where the engine room is. And now I'm gonna put the tanks in there. I'm gonna put one tank here, and one tank here, and one tank here, and one tank here, and another tank there. So we're gonna label this up. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, that'll, that's good enough, we'll have that right there. So if I, if I lay these over like this, you can kind of see both. If I go here, we have so we can have we can have both views. Why don't we do it like? Why don't we do it like that? We can see. I think we can maybe see if I can adjust the camera. We can kind of see the whole thing. Uh, yeah, almost. Yeah. There. Pretty good. If I have to move it a little bit, we can. Okay. So that's the way they're tied. Now. You should also know that the tanks are probably going to be divided up with a centerline bulkhead, a longitudinal bulkhead that goes like this. So this is number one port, and this is number one starboard, number two port, starboard, port, starboard, port, starboard, port, starboard. Tank, a, a tanker could have five, uh, five uh, tanks, sets of tanks coming back. It could have seven, it could have 10, it could have 11. This is just an example here, the way we have this drawn. It's just one, two, three, four, five. Okay, sounds pretty good. Uh, do you wanna put this here? This is the four peak. Uh, this is this after peak. I don't know why I wrote 
E there, but after peak and for peak area, and um, we, we look pretty good there. So that's what, that's how tankers are laid out. That's a very basic configuration. Um, I got to talk a, a little bit about, um, there was something, and I'm going to show, I'm going to put this in the, uh, I mentioned this before, I'm going to put, I'm going to put a question about that significant event that happened, and I'll put that in the discussion, but it, it really does have to do with uh, why we have segregated ballast. Now, you need to understand this. This is kind of important. Segregated ballast, let's see, that implies that, and here's the statement, we have, as an industry, we have a segregated ballast system on tankers nowadays. And we have for 20 years plus, right? So there's the statement. We now have segregated ballast tanks on tankers. Well, that implies, if you think about this, that implies that we didn't always have that. So what the heck did we used to do? Well, first of all, um, I need to do... Uh, something else here. I need to. Well, I'm looking for a pair of scissors. Where did I do? Where's my scissors? Where's my scissors? All right. So, I'm going to cut up another supporting the forest products industry. I'm going to go here. Um, you know, when a tanker is underway, tanker sort of floats. I'm going to put water level right here. There's the water level, all right? There you go. You know, maybe it's here, but there's not a whole lot of free board, all right? This distance from here to here, from here to here, not a whole lot of free board. The tanker is sitting, there's an awful lot of it, kind of like an iceberg, underwater. But that's in the load condition. As a matter of fact, let's let's go a little bit further with my little pieces of scrap paper. I'm going to say, I'm going to say here, in the loaded condition, this is the way the ship floats. You now, someplace it's not like this, and it's not way down here. Right, I would say right about there. When you look at any ship in a loaded condition, it's not a whole lot of freeboard. Now that's when they they filled up and they go to the discharge terminal, you know, whoever is taking that product, which is uh, going to be offloaded and, and uh, either done something more to it or it's going to be used directly by the consumer. And, uh, and that's the way it would go. When that ship goes back to a, it starts pumping out and it starts getting higher in the water and uh, we'll get rid of that loaded thing right there and we're pumping out. And when that ship uh, gets to this point, it's empty. And as a matter of fact, if he went to the extreme, it would probably look about like this. That's not the right way we want to do it this way here. I mean, it's possible. Think about that. And a little exaggerated, of course. No, it looks kind of, looks kind of freakish like that. But the bulbous bow is all, remember that, uh, that uh, uh, picture that I, showed you um, when we we're talking about the bow you know had the seagull standing on the on the bulbous bow yeah the bulbous bow is almost out of the water that that's a completely this is a completely uh, i'm gonna write another word down here completely light ship you see that a completely l-i-g-h-t it's light it's not loaded it's light well, that is not a safe condition to be in. So we need to do something as we're going back to the load port. We need to put enough, we need to put enough something in that ship so that we can safely go back to the port so we can load another load of cargo. And that is called ballast. So now the ship is in a ballast condition. It's not a loaded condition. It's not a light condition, but somewhere in the middle, probably right about there, now you're in a ballast condition. Probably be a little bit more down by the stern, which means that the stern would be a little bit deeper, so maybe it would look and be riding just about like that. 
That's called a ballast condition. You should know this. You should know that you are in a loaded condition. You should know that you are in a ballast condition or you are in a light condition, light ship. A light ship is kind of a dangerous thing. It puts an awful lot of stress on the ship. It doesn't float very well. It's not a seaworthy ship. That's why we don't do that. Okay. Boy, that was a lot of material, right? And so I gotta watch my time. I'm about 16 minutes into this uh, 30 minute lecture here. Um, well, back in the day, we used to ballast ships, and then, you know we're going back into you know the point there where people like my age were cadets. But there are people who remember you know this who are 45, 55, 65 years old. So we're not you know we're not completely dead yet. But um, the way this used to happen, and it's kind of interesting, we and I can remember this. Um, you would discharge the oil out of the tanks. So they were just covered, you know, there was still oil in them, sort of, you know, think about the inside of a oil can, it's going to be covered with oil. You can't get every little drop out. And then you're, then we would fill that tank up with ballast. The ship would slosh around. The same tank would be used for ballast. You know, we would take number three, there was oil in it, then we would get it all empty, then we would fill it back up with water to put ballast in, and that water would mix with the oil and it would become real soup. It was pretty, pretty bad stuff. And when we got to the discharge port, when we got ready to reload, you know what would we do? The, 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 and this was done not just by U.S. flagships, but it was done across the, across the shipping community. You just pump that into the ocean. Honest, to, honest Honestly, honestly, you would just pump it into the ocean and grab my coffee just to it's actually just hot water. Um, you would, and you would see, I can remember going across the ocean and seeing where uh, tanks had been pumped out and just this oily slick of water that extended from horizon to horizon, like a line, kind of like the in the wake of the ship because they were pumping it out as they were moving and it would be like a hundred, you know, because it had spread out a little bit, like a hundred yard wide oil slick. I'm not talking about, you know, really, really thick oil, but enough so it made a sheen on the water and even more than that sometimes. So really, that that's changed. And there was that singular event that I've referred to now three times that I want you to you know think about and discuss, you know, that changed all that. There was something that happened and because uh, really, you know what that was? That was oil pollution. And, and we just don't do that anymore. Ethically, environmentally, it's not the right thing to do putting oil in the water. Not so good. You'll lose your license if you get caught uh, doing that. In essence, nobody does. Uh, do it, not get caught. Okay. All right, so now, what do we do now? We, we have segregated ballast tanks, segregated let me write that word down. Let me get my pen. Segregated Segregated ballast. It never we never put the, the saltwater ballast to trim the ship as we want it to be, we would never put that into a tank which was used for oil. Segregated ballast. It's a big thing. Remember that word, understand what it is. It is a segregated ballast system. It is totally dedicated. Now, so that, so that maybe means that this tank, this one here, is only used for ballast. You know what that means? If you're a ship owner, if you're a business, if you're on the business side of that, that means I can't use that tank for oil. Well, that's, let's see, there's five tanks. That's one fifth of the ship, let's say, that can't be used to carry oil. Well, it might not be the whole one fifth. It might just be, um, no, 
show you what else they'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll get into this. You know, remember this is a double skin ship here. So these ballast tanks can be, I'm gonna label them. And I'm probably going a little bit further and stepping on some other teacher's toes, but I'll tell you that right now. Sometimes the ballast is put, and I hope that you can see that those belts be for ballast, not B for brackets, like on the last test. Okay. There we go. So, you know, in either event, it takes away from some of the capability. If you did this method, or you just put it in the tank, or you were double hull and you were using some of this uh, space, the double hull space for ballast, it would still take away from, it shrinks the tank, doesn't it? Well, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, I'm going to go back to the, uh, back to the diagram here take my camera out of the way I want you to know that tankers are loaded by way of the shore facility either pumping that product onto the tanker or something called gravity feed it's kind of like open the valve and you can see this is Valdez oil terminal in Valdez Alaska and these tanks up here are where the crude oil comes and is stored. You know, the crude oil comes from the north uh, coastline, it's called the North Slope of Alaska, all the way up in the Arctic. And it comes all the way across the state of Alaska and it's kept here, that's US oil, and it is kept here in these tanks and then it's loaded into the ship. Now you can see down here, let me check you, that is a ship down there. Now, you're gonna have to really squint and that brings up something else. You need to be looking at this on a full screen and not on your device to see that. I know you can expand it out, but you know, let's be using a full size screen. I'm making this to be used on a full size, not to be looked at on a small uh, cellular mobile device. So gravity feed, this, see this, this tanks are way up on the side of the hill here. They're not hills quite as high as this. If, if this was the, if this was the size of the hill over here, they'd be up, but you know, maybe a couple hundred, three, four hundred feet above the ship. That's where these tanks are located. They're not a thousand or two thousand feet way up on top of the mountain. Uh, so gravity feed or pumped onto the ship. That's how they're loaded. Now, when we discharge a tanker, it's always done by the ship's own pumps. That's the next bullet. Tankers discharge by the use of their own pumps. And that discharge is either done, that pumps are either individual pumps which are located down inside each one of the tanks or in a common, what's called a pump room. It's kind of like the extension of the engine room. Uh, a common pump room where all the pumps are kept. So get that again, they're either singular pumps in each one of the tanks or their common pump rooms. Before we go on and talk about pump rooms, let's just go on to the next slide and let's take another view of Valdez, Alaska. Now here, there's no ship at that dock. That's where the ship was the last time. And you can kind of see where the tank farm is here. And I see it's all protected. So in case any one of those tanks, there's, there'll be no spills. But there, there are uh, pipelines that go down and go to the ships. Like I said, a couple hundred feet, two or three or 400 feet above the ship. And just look at the size of these tanks compared to the size of the ships that would talk at these docks down here. So let's go back to this tanker. And uh, we're thinking about that. And, uh, and yeah, you get it, it's really big. And I'm gonna go back to my view of my camera and I'm gonna do this. And I'm going to say, here's one option. We could have a pump in every single one of these tanks. There could be a pump here, a pump here, a pump here, a pump here, and a pump here. And, and in the reality, what that would translate to, it would even be, uh, it would be more like this. There would be a pump here and a pump here, a pump here and here and here and here and here and here. 
and those would be called deep well pumps. Know that term, deep well pumps. And so it's a separate pump in every, in every particular. And they're connected by pipelines to be able to load, to rather to discharge the ship. Now the other, the other method, the other method of doing this, I'm going to come back, is to make use. And so I am going to have to, um, I don't suppose I can erase that. Let me see if I can. I, uh, yeah, I can erase it a little. I'm trying, just imagine that I'm trying to erase those. And I'll just put like an X to them. So they're not there. Those deep well pumps are not there. Another way of doing this is to use the pump room. In this space, you may be wondering about this space. This is the pump room. And it's kind of interesting. In this particular situation, the pumps are located in the pump room. These are pumps that turn, you know, they, they, they are uh, centrifugal pumps. And there is a pipeline that goes into every tank up here and the pipeline comes up and it terminates and it terminates and it terminates and it terminates and it comes up and it can be terminating each tank. But the interesting thing is that this spinning pump that I just drew here, and I'll try to make it as bold as possible, and we'll label that as a pump, okay? What's over here in the engine room, I'll make this a blue box, that is the electric motor that drives the pump. Now, I'm gonna zoom in here and kind of come in real close. Okay, so what we got is we've got, here's the pump. Here's the motor. Motor's in the engine room. We got a pump full of, I don't know, petroleum product, which, you know, is kind of potentially explosive. So you wanna separate them by this bulkhead and we have a shaft coming out of the, we have a shaft coming out of the pump, rather out of the motor, and the shaft goes through the bulkhead and goes into the pump, so it spins the pump, so they are separated. And that's kind of a key point. Okay. Remember, we've got deep well pumps, those are the individual pumps, or we've got this system where we've got a pump room. The room, the pump room here, it's between the cargo tanks and the engine room. It's a smaller space. It's kind of a void space. You have to, in order to get down in that pump room, there's no elevator. There is a stair system that gets down to the bottom. You know, and that could be five or six flights of stairs. So if you go into a pump room, you're going to, you don't want to forget that you need to bring everything you need. It's ventilated space. It's lit. Uh, you'd want to be, uh, you, you, you'd you be careful like going into any big space like that, very industrial. You, uh, you'd have to be certainly careful, but it is a lit and a habitable ventilated space. Okay, let me look at my time here. So we're gonna finish up there and uh, we've got good stuff and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, call it, we'll call it good. Um, that's, that finishes up part uh, uh, lecture, online lecture five alpha, and we'll come back with online lecture five bravo. And so very good, we'll talk to you later and uh, have, a good, have a good Friday. See you later.